I don't need to introduce myself, right? <laughs> you all know who I am. Um, and if you don't, I'm Lori Curtis, and I'm chair of the Department of Archives and Special Collections at Loma Linda University. And I have been in the archive and special collections business for about 28 years, so I've been around the block, I guess. Um, I had purposely planned, you know, my talk you know, to be, well, some of you guys can sit back and relax or fall back asleep or something. <laughs> I knew that most of the day, I mean, it was going to be intense learning about the advent of digital libraries, and I thought, your brains just need a break. <laughs> so this is going to be quick, it's light, it's, um, yeah. Um, first, well, the title is, So What Makes a Good Finding Aid? And I guess first, do you all know what a finding aid is? Anybody not know what a finding aid is? Anybody awake out there? <laughs> Okay, I guess you're all experts. I can just close up and um, definition. Or maybe I should ask, what is your definition of a finding aid? Anybody? Somebody? Steve? Something to find what I'm looking for. <laughs> that helps you find what you're looking for. I'm Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> I want to find it. You, you want it to find it for you. Okay. <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, okay, where's the? Here's a um, definition that finding aids in the archival term or the archival arena are descriptive inventories, indexes, or other guides that archival repositories create to describe the contents of archival records and manuscript collections and to provide access to material. Finding aids provide information about records, the context of their creation, archival actions such as their acquisition, processing, organization, retention, and disposal. That's pretty good. Um, here's another one. Um, a tool that facilitates discovery of information within a collection of records, establishing physical, legal, and intellectual control of a collection. You can also think of a finding aid as a map that you have a student, a scholar, someone shows up at your repository and they need a map to find you know, the buried treasure that, you know, 300 boxes deep, you know, in your archive and find that a good way to think about finding aids. And if you have collections, good idea to have finding aids. Finding aids have been with us for millennia. Here are some examples. Like tablets, scrolls, handwritten ledgers, index cards, a list, card catalogs, typewritten documents, word process documents, databases, spreadsheets, electronic documents, dot, dot, dot. Um, index at the back of a book, that's a finding aid. You know, think, you know, broadly of what a finding aid is and what do we call them? A finding aid, if you think of that, like the genre term. You know, that's the, so what do we call them when we're producing them in paper, electronic. Various institutions call them various things. Some folks call them a register. Some folks call them an inventory, a calendar, an index. And one thing I'd like to, oh, and I use none of the above. But um, one thing that I'd like folks to think about when they're, and it sounds silly, I mean, what does it matter what we call it? as long as it's useful. Um, I guess that's one of the first things you need to define for yourself is what is the purpose for your finding aid? What do you want it to do? Steve wants it to, you know, find him and, you know, hand it over to him on a platter. 
And this may be silly, but different terms mean different things to different people. Different words have different connotations. Uh, what's the first thing that you think of when you see register? Anybody? Am I the only one that thinks about words? Marriage register? A marriage register. A cash register. Um, if you're a student of war and battles such as I, you'd be familiar with registers of the dead. Those that fell in a particular battle or war. The yeah, they're um, terribly important, terribly useful, like the Register of the Dead of the city of Charleston that died, you know, battle. But generally, they don't give you all the information that you might want to find out about those individuals, you know, or that one individual. Nor do they generally tell you where else to go to find that information. So um, just when you're constructing your finding aids, and they're in whatever format you choose, think about even just the basic thing of what you're going to call it. And the same with an inventory, a calendar. That's maybe a term that is not as well used in the U.S. I don't know. Um, an index. I mean, that's, and as I said, I don't use either any of those. I like to think my finding aids are guides. As I said, you know, you've got your student, your scholar coming in. And let's say you have a collection that's in 300 blocks. And when I was at the University of Tulsa, yeah, that was, we had lots of collections. See. And, you know, this person's coming, it'd be like finding a needle in a haystack. Or, you know, when you think about, yeah, they need a guide. They need, you know, like the mountain climbers, you know, Mount Everest, you know, they need their own Sherpa guide, you know, that will, you know, lead the way to the information that they're trying to find, that they need. And that's why I use the term guide. I also think it's more active and helpful sounding. Um, indexes are helpful, inventories, all that. And this is just personal bias here. There's no right or wrong. But a lot of times, some of these, a list sounds static. That, and I like to acknowledge at least in my institution, that finding aids are living, breathing, changing things. And they're alive, they're active, they're going to help. I haven't quite got it where it will deliver on a silver platter, but I'm working on that. <laughs> so, um, so I use the term God. I have to confess, I just wrote this yesterday. <laughs> and I do apologize for not doing the splashy, prezzy, you know, whatever presentation. Frankly, prezzy makes me nauseous. Does <laughs> <laughs> that happen to anybody else? I have to sit through one and I'm just, you know, turning green and falling out of my chair. And I thought, eh, we'll just skip that and I'll just quick and easy. Okay. Again, Keeping in mind, what is your purpose for creating this, this map to the, the collection? And it could be a collection of 300 boxes. It could be a collection of five photographs. But what is your purpose? And that, you know, what is the important information that you need? Here is a list of some of the important information that I feel that you need. Like they were saying this morning with the Adventist Digital Library, 
um, everything having a unique identification number, unique ID code. And at Loma Linda started and created, each collection has its collection number, which like Rose, I used the year it was acquired by Loma Linda and then the number of donation or acquisition of that year. So, you know, 1992, it was acquisition number 356. So that is its unique number. And I thought, I thought you were about to comment on something. I just want to know if that's up with court. Yes. Yep. Um, and you know, repository information. Have any of you ever been browsing around on the internet and you're looking for information and you pull up you know, some institution's finding aid and you have to kind of scroll through several pages to even figure out what institution it is that you're, you know, this is some information that you really kind of want right up front. You know. Who has this material? Um, what is the name of the collection? What is its title? Um, date span. If I'm looking for, you know, correspondence in the 1850s, it'd be nice to know right up front that, you know, these collections I'm looking through actually include material from the 1850s. Um, the extent. What is the size of this collection? Am I looking at 300 boxes or am I looking at, you know, five letters? Um, linear feet, you know, that's often archives use that. A lot of the standard folks don't really know what that means. You know, translate that into you know, a cubic foot is, you know, what? It's one of these standard archival boxes a number of boxes, a number of folders, a number of items. And who created this collection? Is it somebody's papers? Or is it an artificial collection that you assembled because you found all this disparate stuff? Let the researcher know. Um, the scope and content. Okay, what is the, the scope of this collection? Is it... Uh, Broom's papers when he was working on his book, Prophetic Space of Our Fathers. Say that. What's the content in there? Photocopies or title pages or something. Um, let the researcher know. How did you decide to arrange it? Did you keep it in original order? Does anybody know what original order is? Lots of times, if you've been in the business as long as I have, you get collections that have absolutely no order. <laughs> or that's what you think, you know. And so you say, you know, this is just, you know, somebody, this is like a dumpster, you know, and I've got to impose some order on it. But you need to say that. You say it nicely. You don't say, well, the creator of this had absolutely no organizational skills <laughs> and, you know, had never seen, you know, file folders or, you know, things in his life. No, you just say that, you know, the material came to us, you know, without any apparent, you know, organization. We decided to organize it by format. So I have my letters here, all my photographs here, all, you know, this. However you've decided, let the researcher know. And it's always nice to have a biographical historical note if these are papers of a person, well, who were they? And that helps, again, say why your repository, why you have this collection, why you care. Um, access conditions or restrictions. Is this an open collection? Um, don't get somebody all excited because they found the mother load of information. 
and then they make you know the plane reservations and they take the time off and they come to your institution and you say oh I'm sorry that collection's closed for 50 years you know let them know up front and you know if there's any you know other restrictions yeah you can see it but you know we're not going to make you copies of anything or whatever you know the terms governing the access and use of this collection get it out there and very helpful what language is the material in um you may have this collection and you're doing this finding aid in english and you can tell anybody that the actual material is in swahili you know so someone's getting there again all excited and then they find out even if they do come to your institution they are not going to be able to read the material so let them know up front and ahead of time what language or languages are present in that collection again terms governing the use and reproduction um, do you have you know permissions to make copies you know whether you know copyright permissions or permissions from you know whatever no off no copyright law what you can and can't do for um, personal research and what you can and can't do as a library so there are some things that libraries can do that the individual can't and vice versa um provenance where did you get this material and um yeah and when and, and copyright some other helpful elements who created the finding aid I mean, it may not mean anything up front to the researcher but it may down the road when they're wondering, oh, wait a minute, you know, if I could just talk to the person that organized the collection, that created the finding aid, has the collection been digitized? And um, by whom? When? How can they access the you know the digital copies? And the, you know, if you have you know links from your finding aid, you know, they just Quick and Zippo, you know, they're over to the, the digital copy. That's great. Um, what's the preferred citation form for the collection and the items within the collection? If you're dealing with you know, doctoral students or someone's writing their book, they're going to ask. They don't always do what you tell them, but <laughs> often they ask. And um, this is really, really important. Um, I don't know how many times in my history of being in the Archives of Special Collections building that we will come across, you know, somebody published a book and it used a photograph or a letter or something, and all they would say back when I was at the University of Tulsa would be, well, sometimes they get the name of the university wrong, but they might just say University of Tulsa. And sure enough, somebody else comes, has the book, and shows, I want to see this. And you're going, well, that's great. You know, let me try and figure out what collection that would have been in you know, this. And citing you know, if they, you know, a lot of times they say, oh, I've got, you know, space considerations. I'm not going to be able to get all the information that you'd like. They can at least get the collection name right and the institution name right. At least you have a fighting chance of finding it. And what's the processing history? What have you done to the collection? They're again, organizing it. Did you do any conservation treatment to items in it? Did you remove items and not, you know, did you remove them as and throw them away? Or even did you 
remove them from the rest of the collection in the box, and they're housed over here. The researcher needs to know this. And also what's very helpful, related materials. That's great. You know, we just acquired a photograph album that deals with the Olson family. It was created by uh, the wife of A.G. Olson, <coughs> Elizabeth Hanson Olson. Um, so we've got it digitized and every photograph you know, is described and all this. But if I didn't tell the researchers that, oh, by the way, we also have this very large collection you know, over here of A.B. Olson stuff or, you know, O.A. Olson and like this, I'm not really being that Sherpa guide that um, my researcher needs. So tell them, you know, if you have related materials to that item they're looking for. I know often, and uh, being sort of the reference librarian, or that, you know, student or somebody would come in and they just request this one book. I'd like to see this. Great. What about the five books on either side of it? You know, they're on topic. You know, here, you might, you know, and then you find out, well, yeah, it's actually, you know, the third one over on the left was really what they were looking for. But if you hadn't said, oh, did you know that there's all this other information, they would have been happy with the one book that they requested and left. <laughs> so, tell them, give them as much information as you can. Access points. I started my professional career, well, actually I never really officially worked as a cataloger. I did my master's thesis on rare book cataloging and I did part of my internship in cataloging 17th century British government pamphlets. And that was, I did my internship at the William Andrews Clark Library as part of UCLA. And I showed up and I said, show me the hardest thing you have here to catalog. I'm going to do it. And they said, okay. <laughs> and I did. You know, great fun. You know, catalogers are a special breed. Um, but and everybody needs to embrace controlled vocabularies, um, subject headings. Yes, we've all sort of created our own subject headings because Library of Congress just missed the boat on certain topics. And that's fine, you know, put them in there. But also put the Library of Congress subject headings, authority headings. You know, um, there are so many different thesauri for um, terms, for graphic materials. Um, the J. Paul Getty Research Library, the Art and Architecture Thesaurus, the source of geographic names, which, yes, they're always changing on us. Um, there's a thesaurus for using college and university archives, and there's so much more. And um, standards, whether you're doing you know, ISAD or you know what. Find out the standards, find out the terms, try and use them, and that just makes me think. <laughs> um, but just the facts. A finding aid, yeah, you want to put as much information about that material that you're cataloging that you're organizing as you can. But a finding aid is not the place to editorialize. Mm -hmm. It's not the place for you to comment on the theology of the individual whose papers you're organizing, whether you agree with him, whether you don't. Um, it's not the place to, you know, make disparaging remarks about your sister institutions or <laughs> such. Just to the facts and you know, that. 
when I had, it's actually after I had titled my talk, you know, so what makes a good finding aid? I thought, well, am I talking good and evil? Or, you know, what? <laughs> and at first I thought, no, you know, not. And then I'm going, well, you know, finding aids can sin. <laughs> and probably the, the biggest sin is the sin of omission. If you leave stuff out that your researcher needs to know, your finding aid is <laughs> Um some things to keep in mind if you're going to put your finding aids out on the web. Um, and again, some institutions only create their finding aids um, electronically. Some create paper and then put them you know, electronically out there. And later in this conference, Alfredo's going to talk to us about at least one um, archival software program help you with this. There are several out there. But there are things you need to keep in mind if your finding aids going out in the you know, big bad world. Um, oops. I guess I didn't put it down. Uh, one thing is keep your abbreviations to a minimum. Um, when back in the day, when all we did was paper finding aids, because frankly the internet hadn't been invented yet, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you were chiseling there on that clay tablet, you really didn't want to spell out, you know, this person's name, you know, it's the John Doe papers. You didn't want to say every line, John Doe, you know, letter to, you know, John Doe, you know, so you, would abbreviate him, JD, you know. Well, in the internet age, odds are, unless it's like FDR or something with sort of famous initials, folks aren't going to be searching for John Doe by the abbreviation that you selected. So even though you have the world's best collection of John Doe papers, if someone's searching the internet, and you've abbreviated him, they're not going to find him. So, you know, keep that to a minimum. You can abbreviate things like, you know, if you're measuring your photographs in inches or, you know, centimeters. Yeah. Because odds are somebody's not going to do an internet search for inches. Maybe they are, but, you know. So, things like that. And, there are standard archival abbreviations for document types. Um, an autograph letter signed. You know, when you get really tired of, you know, typing out, you know, this standard in archival work, ALF. You know, that, and unless you're, isn't that also the abbreviation for Lou Gehrig's disease? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> But, you know, so some people may, you know, they may be trying to research Lou Gehrig's disease and find all your finding aids. But um, there are some things like that. And if you're going to use abbreviations for document types, use the standard ones. You know, don't get too wild and creative. There's, there's a whole list. I think there's a book by Duckett that has a whole list. And that's pretty much what you use. Um, other things to keep in mind on the web, you know, when you're dealing with a uh, paper finding aid and the person sitting in your reading room when they have this, you know, if they're on page four, well, it's not too hard to flip back and go, okay, you know, it's this. If you're on the web, Sometimes you get, you know, down to you're on page 32 of the finding aid and you're going, now what collection am I looking at? You know, where am I? What box? What, you know. So these things to keep in mind that, you know, the web isn't restricted to an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. And so, you know, just keep in mind your researcher 
how they're going to be coming to your finding aid and how you can make their job of finding one finding your finding aids but also finding the information less painful okay and speaking of finding aids out on the web does everybody know what EAD is? Ashley Bitter. <laughs> sure. Yes. That's been around a while. Um, sort of the archival world's response to Mark. Um, they felt we needed an encoding system for encoding our finding aids so that they could be read by machines and everybody would know. Um, it's a no. I mean, it's in process, <coughs> and I'm trying to think of when it first, I mean, it's been over a decade, it's probably, it's probably closing in on two decades. When did this, it's been around a while. And, I think maybe, and there's still you know, two schools of thought. Um, it's easy to get overwhelmed by the idea. And that's why, one, folks started creating software programs that helped with the overwhelming aspects of trying to encode, and it's a XML language and you have all these tags and before and after and when it first came out I said I want stickers <laughs> I want color-coded stickers you know and everybody thought that was a great idea but you know I didn't get a company to sign on to <laughs> produce those um, but also I just read an article the other day that was saying is EAD getting in the way of that wasn't finding aids. And is it as necessary with, you know, keyword searching? Is it, you know, and that's, you know, a question one you will have to decide. And, you know, if my, say I, you know, take my finding aid and I turn it into a PDF and it's out there on the web, it's Harvestable, Google finds it, searches it, someone's doing keyword, and they find the information. Is it important that it's in XML coded or not? I'm not going to make a statement on <laughs> that. Um, yes, I'm sure. <laughs> and that's why I'm leaving that to Alfredo to, to talk about. And this is not really about, well, sort of about finding aids. Um, everybody know what MPLP stands for in the archival business? Ashley. More product, less process. Yes. And I adamantly disagree with this. But they're getting back to personal opinion based on almost 30 years of experience in the business. What it means is don't spend so much time processing a collection and describing it. Do less and end up with more. Well, but you have more of what? Well, this is what <laughs> I've been being trained in Yeah. Uh, because it's the thing right now. Mm -hmm. It's more less item description because the finding aid that I've created um, with the collection I processed, I still went through everything, but I didn't make a separate record for each uh, calendar that was in the calendar section. It was like, this section is about the calendar, and monthly, weekly, that kind of thing. So it depends on how you implement it at an institutional level. Some people do a little bit more, some do a little bit less, where I work at for my work study job, it's what I just said, but the university archives, which is right next door, 
they do more, um, a little bit more item. And then when we're, one of my classmates works at one of the really specialized collections libraries on campus, and they do item processing jobs. So you will find um, in this last week searching around, and I found several individual PowerPoint presentation on creating finding aids, and it said. If you have more than five items, do not, you know, do item level descriptions. Oh, that's a little. We do item level descriptions, and we've done this. I've done this for 28 years. Um, I have had an item level description for the uninitiated. You know, you have a collection. There again, 300 boxes however many folders you can fit in the box, how many pieces of paper in a folder. You know, let's say you have 10 letters per folder and you can fit 50,000 pages in a standard size yeah. folder box. So do you list them all individually or do you say box one has correspondence from 1852 to 1910? That's what some would say. Now, when the researcher finds your finding aid online or knows that you have this collection, what's their first question? Do you have any correspondence from John Doe in the year 1862? That's their job. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is where I completely disagree. Um, Back in back in the day, there again, and you know, from the dinosaur era, when um, in order to use a collection, an individual from India or Australia would, would have to fly to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and look in a box. Are they going to fly all the way to this place? And I'll bring out 300 boxes so they can see if, you know, that maybe, you know, two letters exist by, from the person in the time frame or whatever that they're looking for. And as being a helpful librarian, that, you know, I get calls, phones, faxes, emails. And so if we hadn't, while we were processing the collection, listed all of this, we would be going back to the collection, pulling this box, going through, saying, yes, you know, we have five letters. And they're going, oh, well, what are the dates? Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, back to the, <laughs> you know. So as long as I'm doing that, as long as I'm handling every item when I'm organizing, why not just write the information down? You know, I, um, and in most of this has um, been at, when I was at the University of Tulsa, because one at Loma Linda, I could just tell everybody what to do. <laughs> and, um, I was interviewing for an, it was actually supposed to be a digital librarian position within special collections. And um, I was you know, around showing them our finding aids and you know, item level description. And she looked and she goes, oh, you did these all wrong. Guess who didn't get the job? Yeah. <laughs> so she didn't. Um, but anyway, there's difference of opinion, and um, yes, you you make judgment calls as to well, is this collection really worth you know the the complete description? I always err on the side of getting more information than less. But there again, I've spent nearly 30 years answering people's questions about the collection. <coughs> and also, and of course, um, when I've had scholars that come and say, oh, they spent you know, this time at Harvard or Yale or at Oxford or what, and they go, your finding aids are the most helpful finding aids they've ever dealt with. Uh, and um, when it was allowed a scholar to 
zero in on that part of the collection that they needed to focus on instead of wading through, you know, 300 boxes. I think that's a good thing. And then also, um, in fact, it's also sort of in, when I got to Tulsa, we had thousands of books that had minimal level cataloging. You know, because there were states with like 66,000 books that had no record. So I could understand, I mean, that was just part of the collection. You know, if you've never been to the University of Tulsa and their special collection, do go. Absolutely not your small copy, but that's another talk. Um, minimum level cataloging. So they had all these books that had author, title, publisher, and date. That's pretty good. And they said, oh, we'll just get these all out here, and then we'll have time to go back and you know, do it completely and fill it out. We never have time to go back. You know, so if you're handling the material, you know, write it down. That's, okay, that's my edit script. And you can make your own decision. And that's it. So, any questions? Thank you. That was very, very useful, very informative. And um, I completely agree that the most process you put into something, uh, in a, into a funding aid, the better. Uh, just bear in mind that at institutions like mine, where resources and staff are very limited, um, you know, you have to pick your battles. And mm -hmm. so what we do is we only go into something really, really if it's something that has already been requested for use. Mm -hmm. Until that happens, then we have a very general description. And something like the White States uh, manuscript and letters, they've done a terrific job in listing all the correspondence with addresses and places mm -hmm. of uh, where they were, uh, the items were written, etc. It's such a, it's one of uh, the most used collections uh, in our uh, in our different institutions, and at, at least in ours, it is. Uh, so it it it, it uh, it's worth a while to do it for that collection. But for other collections, you know, that are not yet used, um, we prefer to wait until somebody's interested to start getting into the details. Can I play devil's advocate? And Go ahead. To that? <laughs> How are they going to know and be interested in it if they don't know you have it? Well, they know we might have it. <laughs> <laughs> they know we have the correspondence from X to Y. And so they request it. And they say, I'll be in you know, later today. If they can be in later <laughs> today, then we give them the box and they can find it themselves. But if they have to travel from <laughs> India, then we start working seriously on creating a detailed finding aid. Do you contribute your finding aids to Archive Grid or anybody else here? Um, haven't yet with Lynn and Linda. When I got there, there were no finding aids. There were some inventories which were really interesting because the gentlemen that worked in um, the archives were both Romanian. And I mean, they did amazingly well. And they're English, but sometimes I would look at, you know, their you know, rough inventories and go, like, what are they trying to tell me? And I'd have to kind of try to translate from Romanian, which I don't speak, into, you know, English and go, ha, ah, that's what they meant. Um, so there were very rough inventories. There were no finding aids. Um, been working on that, and I do understand the, you know, short staff. Um, I also, well, I have no staff that are trained in archival work, so I've been teaching them, and um, that, and the, you know, in California, 
there's you know, a lot of people, a lot of institutions contribute their finding aids to the online archive of California. I think they don't like the online archive of California. Not, I, I mean, I like the concept, but I don't like what they do to your finding aids. Put it up there. But I think it's a great idea, it's sort of like the Union Catalog of Finding Aid concept. So, I mean, I'm supportive of that. I'm just not there yet. Well, when I came into archives, I inherited, we didn't have finding aids. Um, I came into context that somebody before me had created a database. Mm -hmm. But in that, for instance, letters, they put, um, you know, from Smith to Jones. Absolutely told me absolutely nothing. Uh, and we looked at transferring the all of that data across to a new database because the other one was crashing. And we eventually said, look, let's just forget it and let's start again. It was the easier to actually start again. We actually database every item. Um, and therefore, people can do a keyword search mm -hmm. and actually look it up. But I see the sense in what you're doing in creating a finding aid for a collection, yeah, which is something we haven't done, because it gives a, gives the viewer or your researcher an overview of what is in that whole collection. The, um, the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas, Austin, they had started out individually cataloging every manuscript, letter, whatever, and you know, database, or I guess, you know, back in the day, it was card catalog. And they recently realized that they actually lost a lot of the information that comes in knowing that this letter or something is part of a collection. For the, the scholar to know this isn't just a lone item, you know, that it you know, was part of somebody's papers, and they didn't have that information. So they have now, you know, gone back. It's very useful, yes, to have that database. You can keyword and that, but, yeah, don't lose the sort of collection, you know, its, its history, its working? Where, where a series title is there that? Um, yes. But again, you would have to have that input on every single record. You know. So it's, yeah. Um, oh, which was like comment um, that Julie made this morning about periodicals in ABL and that, you know, the marked record is just for the whole title and not the issue. Well, it's like when I put um, periodicals up on our, you know, digital asset management program, each issue has its own metadata, so it's identified issue and the subject headings and the article author titles like that. With um Dublin Core or not doing bib records. Yeah. Yeah. Um but yes. Series which is another thing in your you know, organization which you know I didn't talk about so much with the finding aids you know, organization of an archival collection is more involved with it. series. I do that on, um, yeah, in, we're using Content DM, which has its good points and bad points. Lately, I wanted to toss it out the window, <coughs> but um, it's great for photographs and things like this. It doesn't do so well for large text. And, um, but when I'm doing, you know, like the collections that we recently digitized all of the um, 
historical church records for um, the Adventist Church in Merced that started in 1905. And for each item in that you know, that I have on, um, it will say, you know, one identifies the item, but this is in series one, this is in, you know, collection, you know, so that information, you know, the metadata for that individual item has all of that information on it. So, yes, theories, subjects, all that important. Okay. Um, um, is Lee, you had mentioned earlier today about possibly taking folks to find dinner. So if you're wanting to eat somewhere other than the hotel, 